Welcome to part two of my RCA sound cartridge series. In the last episode, we confirmed that the motor, tubes, power transformer, and output transformer are working, but we still had no sound from the player. So we decided to replace all the wax paper caps and the electrolytic filter capacitor. At the end of part one, we removed and tested the filter cap, revealing that one section was bad. In this episode, I'll show my new method to replace multi-section filter capacitors and a unique way I find the foil side of capacitors. We'll replace the wax paper caps, test and replace faulty resistors, remove corrosion from the RCA jacks, replace the selenium rectifiers, and I'll show you how to calculate values for dropping resistors. Finally, I'll remove the fossilized remains of the old belt and install a new one. Will all that add up to finally getting some sound out of our player? Stay tuned. Let's first install the new filter capacitors. To do this, I created a new method that worked well. The trick is to use clear acrylic plastic. First, I cut a one and a half inch square piece of the material. I mark the plastic where the twist lock tabs of the old electrolytic fit into the chassis and also where the old electrolytics terminals protruded. I then drilled small holes in these positions and installed the positive leads of the new capacitors using the center holes and the negatives to the outer holes. To hold the assembly neatly into position, the negative leads were bent against the chassis and I temporarily inserted a foam stick between the capacitors and cinched them with a cable tie. The negative leads were then soldered to the chassis to provide the necessary electrical connection and hold the assembly firmly in place. The electrolytic filter capacitors are all in place and I've securely mounted them by soldering the negative ground leads to the chassis. Before we connect the positives of the electrolytics, I want to test these resistors that connect to them as well as some of the others and also replace these wax paper caps as they also connect to the electrolytics. I've got one of my resistance meters set up here. Let's test a few resistors. Let's test this yellow violet brown resistor first. This should measure 470 ohms. And at about 526 ohms, we're getting over the 10% rating for this resistor. So I should really consider replacing this. Let me mark it. Let's test this red, red, orange resistor now. This should measure 22K. And this one's coming in a little bit low at about 21K. But no problem as this is still within the 20% tolerance for the resistor. Let's try the next one. There is a yellow, blue, yellow resistor tucked under here, which should measure 460K. Let's test it. On this meter, the resistor is measuring as a capacitor. Let me try it with a different meter. Okay, on this meter, we're getting about 534K. Again, this is fine as it falls within the 20% tolerance for the resistor. Let's move on. We have an orange, orange, brown resistor here that should measure 330 ohms. And it's just about dead on at 332. There are two brown, black, green resistors here, which should measure one mega ohm each. Let's test the first one. Excellent, 1.078 mega ohms. Let's try the next one. And this one's about the same at 1.086 mega ohms. Perfect. Let's check a few more. We have two brown, gray, red resistors here, which should measure 1.8K. Perfect. Let's check the other one. Perfect. There's actually two more. Let's check those. There are two brown, black, red resistors here, which should measure 1K. First one looking good at about 958 ohms. And this one's coming in at 923 ohms. Now this is a silver band resistor, meaning that it has a tolerance of 10%, and 923 falls within that tolerance, so this resistor is also fine. Let's just quickly test these two yellow, blue, yellow resistors, which should measure 460K. And again, this meter's having a little difficulty reading these resistors, seeing them as capacitors. And this happens with this meter often when I'm measuring resistors in circuit. Let's get the other meter. Okay, 432K for the first one, that's fine. Let's check the other. And about 447K, also fine. Okay, I think I've tested enough resistors. We only had one bad one here and it really wasn't too far off. Since this one is already more or less disconnected, I'll go ahead and replace it. But I'll wait to see if we have any problems with the circuit before I check the other resistors. I don't think they're gonna give us any trouble. These are the capacitors I've selected to replace the old wax paper caps in our recorder. We have two at 0.02 microfarad and two at 0.04 microfarad. 
Now the wax paper caps in the recorder are marked for the foil side, which indicates the lead that's connected to the outer foil of the capacitor. The outer foil provides shielding for the capacitor, which can help minimize noise. Newer capacitors like these aren't marked for the outer foil, but that can be determined by doing a test on the capacitors. There are lots of ways to do this, but let me show you one method that I use. I made this little test jig to test for the foil side on capacitors. It's nothing more than four spring clips that allows me to attach oscilloscope probes in the back and the capacitor under test in the front. This side is for the ground connection of the oscilloscope and this for the positive. When a capacitor is inserted to these two spring terminals, this lead will connect to the ground of the oscilloscope and this lead will connect to the positive of the oscilloscope. And the reason I have it set up this way is it allows me to quickly disconnect and reposition the capacitor. And it allows me to test the capacitor with the probe always in the same position and without my hands in the way influencing the results. And what we're trying to determine from all this is which side of the capacitor is the noisiest and which is the quietest. When the capacitor is oriented for the lowest amount of noise shown on the oscilloscope, the capacitor lead attached to the ground terminal will be the foil side. Now you might be wondering why I have the audio generator set up here. You might think that I'm going to inject a signal into the capacitor and read the results on the oscilloscope. But actually, I've positioned the audio generator here because it simply makes a lot of AC noise. And when placed in close proximity to our foil side tester, it creates a lot of noise at 60 Hz, which we can easily pick up on the oscilloscope. Let me demonstrate. Let's measure one of our 0.04 microfarad capacitors first. Put it in our tester. And we can see on the oscilloscope, we're getting some random noise here. Now watch what happens when I turn on the audio generator. And you can see now that the capacitor is now picking up the 60 Hz noise signal coming from the audio generator. And with the capacitor oriented in this position, the RMS voltage of the noise is at about 0.48 millivolts. Let's measure this noise now with the leads reversed on the capacitor. With the capacitor leads in this position, the RMS voltage of the noise signal has increased 2.56 millivolts. And we can see this increase on the display. Let's switch it back again. And we're back down to about 0.48 millivolts. So with the capacitor oriented in this position, it's picking up the least amount of noise. And because in this position, this lead is connected to the ground, we know that this side is the foil side. Let me mark the capacitor to indicate that. Just a black dot on that side. Let's measure the other capacitors. Here's our other 0.04. In this position, 0.48 millivolts. Let's swap it. In this position, 0.56 millivolts, telling us that this side of the capacitor is the shielded side. Let's mark that. Let's test one of the 0.022 capacitors. In this position, 0.88 millivolts. And in this position, a lower 0.72 millivolts, indicating that this is our shielded side. Let's mark it. And finally, let's test our other 0.022 microfarad capacitor. 0.88 millivolts in this position. Let's swap it. About 0.72 millivolts in this position, indicating that this is our foil side. Here are the four capacitors we marked. Interesting to note that on the 2.022 capacitors on top, the foil side is on the left, while on the 2.04 capacitors, the foil side is on the right. So you can see that with new capacitors, the way that the printing is oriented gives you no clue whatsoever about the foil side. And that's why we do the test. Next, I removed the old wax paper caps and installed modern replacements. I connected the positive leads of the filter capacitors and replaced the faulty resistor with a new one. To permanently stabilize the filter capacitors, I installed a piece of foam between them and cinched a wire tie around them. Everything looks good.
Next, I sprayed Neutral into the volume control and switches and Contact Cleaner into the tube sockets. The RCA jacks were badly corroded, so I cleaned them a bit with a Dremel and Contact Cleaner. Okay, we've replaced the electrolytic capacitors, the wax paper capacitors, and that one resistor we found faulty. Let's power it up again with our Variac and make sure we don't have any problems. And additionally, let's see if we now have some sound output from our player. I've got both speakers hooked up. The one that's part of the main unit and powered by a tube amplifier, and the outboard one which is powered by its own solid state amplifier. Let's power it up now and monitor our dim bulb current limiter making sure that the bulb doesn't glow brightly, indicating that we have a fault in our wiring. Let's begin. Turn on the current limiter, put our variac to zero, power on. Let's put our player in the play mode, and let's slowly bring up our voltage. Okay, so far so good. We can hear that our motor is turning. Let's continue. Great, we're at 120 volts, I see no shorts, and we're getting some sound from our speakers. Now the belts that I ordered for the player haven't arrived yet, but we can still do a quick test to make sure that we're getting some sound from our playhead. And I'll do this by injecting some hum into the tape head with my screwdriver. Let's begin. Great, we're getting output from both channels. Let's now try injecting a tone into the amplifiers to see how clear our sound is. I'm going to use this signal generator to input a tone into the volume control for both channels. Let's begin. There's one channel, sounds good. And there's the other channel. Great news, both amplifiers now seem to be working. There were two selenium rectifiers in our player and they had to go. That's because they're notoriously prone to failure, which can result in a fire and the emission of toxic fumes. Here I'm removing the selenium which provides the Rectify DC for the left channel's tube amplifier. In its place, I installed a terminal strip to mount the replacement components. First, a diode was installed with the anode connected to chassis ground. Next, I installed a resistor. Later in this video, I'll explain how to select the correct diode to replace the selenium, why a resistor is required, and how to calculate the correct value. Finally, I connected the red wire coming from the transformer and temporarily tack the components in with solder. The terminal strip for our selenium rectifier replacement has been installed and populated. It consists of this IN4007 diode and this 5 watt 100 ohm resistor. A resistor is usually necessary when replacing a selenium rectifier because seleniums have a greater voltage drop than a silicon diode, and the resistor serves to bring the voltage back down to the original specifications for the unit. Now I've only temporarily tacked in this resistor because we may need to change its value. My calculations tell me that 100 ohms should be just about right, but just in case it's not, I've made it so we can easily remove this and try some different resistor values. If the 100 ohm resistor proves to be just right, which I suspect it will be, I'll more permanently install it to the terminal strip. So to test the voltage, I have our fluke meter attached to one of the electrolytics that we replaced, which is supposed to provide 163 volts. So let's power up our tape player now to its rated 120 volts and see how well our selenium rectifier replacement circuit is supplying the required 163 volts. Here we go.
put our fluke meter into DC mode and let's power up the player. And let's monitor the meter. We're looking for 163 volts. Okay, just about there. And our AC input voltage is dead on at 120 volts. So our selenium rectifier replacement circuit is working perfectly. I'm going to power the unit down now and permanently install the resistor and diode. Now let's replace the selenium that provides rectified DC for the right channel. This selenium is part of the main chassis, but the filter capacitors, amplifier, and speaker for the right channel are mounted in the detachable cover assembly. They're connected by a proprietary RCA cable, which provides the audio signal and power and allows for about nine feet of separation between the speakers. Strangely, our RCA player is actually a hybrid unit. The preamps and left channel amp are driven by tubes, but the outboard right channel amp is driven by transistors. And that makes this player one of the earliest solid state consumer devices made. Let's get the old selenium out of there. The selenium rectifier for the 12.7 volt circuit has been removed and for replacement we're going to use two 1N4001 diodes. These are rated for 50 volts at 1 amp so a good choice. The selenium for the circuit was actually two diodes in one and that's what we have here. Each anode is connected to opposite ends of the secondary winding giving full wave rectification and the rectified DC output comes from where the diode cathodes meet and that connects to this red wire which supplies the positive DC output for the outboard solid state amp. Here I've tapped into the jack for the DC output and to do that I had to modify an RCA plug. The hole in the jack is smaller than an ordinary RCA jack so I had to trim this plug down to fit. Let's plug it back in. Here I've connected the leads to my fluke meter so we can monitor the DC voltage and it's also jumped to connect to the outboard amp. This way we can monitor the voltage with the proper load. Now the output to this jack is supposed to be 12.7 volts. And with the old selenium installed and a 120 volt input, that's exactly what we were getting. Now remember our silicon diodes have a lower voltage drop than our selenium rectifier. So voltage here now is likely to be higher. Let's power up the player to 120 volts and see where we're at. And then we can determine if we need a dropping resistor to lower the voltage to 12.7 volts. Let's begin. Let's put our fluke into DC mode and I'll now use the Variac to slowly power up the player to 120 volts. Okay good, you can see that the diodes are rectifying the DC signal and we have an output at just under 14 and a half volts. And again we're looking for 12.7 volts so we need to drop this by about one and a half volts. Now to calculate what size dropping resistor we need, we can use Ohm's law. And Ohm's law states that voltage divided by current gives us resistance. So far we know that our voltage is 1.5 volts, but we don't know our current. So let's use the fluke meter now to determine how much current is flowing through the circuit. To do this, let's change the probe setup for the fluke from measuring voltage to measuring current. The common probe will stay where it is, but our red probe will move to the amp position. Additionally, we need to change where the probes are connected to our circuit. They're not connected in parallel, which is fine for measuring voltage, but for measuring current, we need to put the fluke in series with the circuit. In this configuration, the negative voltage will flow directly to the outboard amp, but the positive voltage from our red wire flows into the fluke first, then comes out of the fluke, and is sent to the positive terminal of the outboard amp. So the current is flowing directly through the fluke so that it can measure that current. Let's put the fluke into current mode, power up the player again, and see how much current we have. And you can see now that we have about 0.29 amps flowing through the circuit. Let's use this now to calculate the size of our dropping resistor. So again, Ohm's law tells us that voltage divided by current equals resistance. In our case, our voltage is 1.5 volts, and our current is 0.29 amps. And 1.5 divided by 0.29 equals 5.17.
So now we know that our dropping resistor needs to be about 5.17 ohms. Now resistors aren't just specified by resistance, they're also specified by wattage. So how do we know what size wattage resistor we need? Well, there's another calculation for that, which says that voltage squared divided by resistance equals power in watts. Our voltage of 1.5 volts squared is 2.25, and if we divide that by our resistance of 5.17, we get 0.435 watts, which tells us that we need at least a half watt resistor. Now, for an extra margin of safety, it's always a good idea to make sure that your resistor is capable of 200% of the needed wattage. So we should really have at least a one watt resistor. So let me see what I have for a resistor that's at least one watt and about 5.17 ohms. I've installed a 6.8 ohm one watt resistor into our test setup. It'll provide a little more resistance than the 5.17 ohms that we determined we needed, but 6.8 ohms was as close as I could get using just one resistor. And the other thing is the voltage in my house is frequently above 120 volts, so this little bit of added resistance is probably a good thing. I've got the Fluke set up again to measure voltage. Let's give it a try. I'm going to bring the Variac up to 120 volts. And you can see that with the dropping resistor, our voltage is now just about perfect, coming in at about 12.5 volts, just a bit lower than the 12.7 that's specified. But as I said, when the player is plugged directly into my household wiring, I'm guessing the voltage is going to be just about right. Let me disconnect the player from the Variac now and plug it directly into one of my house's outlets. Yeah, just as I expected, coming in right around that 12.7 volts. So our little circuit is working great. Let me get it permanently installed into the player. Here you can see the freshly installed selenium replacement circuit for the outboard amp as well as the replacement circuits for the main amp and our main filter replacements. Some of the wires were a bit tighter with the new circuit so I added a piece of rubberized plastic to the chassis edge to protect them from fraying. As is often the case with old tape players, the belt had deteriorated years ago, leaving its fossilized, difficult to remove remains over many of the parts. For proper operation, the remains had to be removed and the parts restored to a smooth finish. I got to work with my Dremel and it took many, many abrasive wheels to get the job done. Even the motor assembly needed to be removed so I could grind the old belt from the pulley. To protect against debris getting in the motor, I covered it with masking tape. That's better. I reinstalled the motor. I installed new belts. I reinstalled the clutch. I reinstalled the flywheel added a drop of oil, and secured everything into place. Would our player finally work? Yes. It's a bit squeaky and the rewind is busted, but we'll fix that in part three. Stay tuned.
To stay updated, please subscribe to my channel and click the bell to receive notifications when I release new videos. And if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up. I'll see you soon.